I've been wanting to make something like this for a long time. And what I mean by something like this is a super compact sandwich style ITX case with some gaming capable hardware on the inside. You know, the type of gaming PC that you could just throw into your backpack and head over to your friend's house for a LAN party. Or generally just a PC that's easy to move around between places. If you'd like that too, I'm sure you will enjoy this build very much. This case has magnetic removable side panels allowing easy access to all its internal components and the overall size of the case is 298 by 247 by 122 millimeters, which translates to roughly 9 liters in volume. Component-wise, the case holds a mini ITX motherboard, a flex ATX power supply, a 300 millimeter PCIe riser cable and a 2-slot GPU up to 270 millimeters in length. There's also room for two 92mm top exhaust fans to pull out any warm air that builds up inside the case. In addition to this, the case is even printable on tiny printers like the Bamboo A1 Mini or Prusa Mini, thanks to the two available versions. The first version is printable on a 180 by 180 mm print volume and relies on split parts and joining mechanisms, while the other version requires a 300 by 300 mm print volume and offers a more clean overall look due to not needing any joints between the parts. In the 180 mm version of the case, all the main parts are numbered, so it's super easy to identify all the parts. Now, if you end up building this case for yourself, you can use this video as reference, but you'll also find full start to finish step by step instructions over on printables to guide you through the entire process. We start the build by grabbing panel 5 and 6, which when joined together will create the internal panel that everything is built around. To these two panels we need to first add a bunch of threaded inserts. Where to put all the inserts will be described with pictures on the written guide over on printables, so make sure you check that out if you decide to build this case for yourself. When all the inserts are added, we can slide panel 6 into the slot in panel 5. Then we can add one M3 by 10 mm screw to each side of the joint to lock the parts together, resulting in a super strong bond. Next, we can grab panel 1, 2, 3 and 4 and lay them out around the internal panel. These four parts can actually be printed as one single print even on a 180 by 180 mm print bed. All four corners secure to the internal chassis by using two M3 by 10 mm screws per part. These screw in from the outside of the chassis. However, before we can screw them in place, we need to grab the lower rear panel, which is part number 4, and remove these custom support pillars, which are intended to break off easily. After that, we also need to add one more threaded insert at the bottom of this same part. This is to secure our GPU into place later. The two rear parts number 2 and 4 will then slide together like this. But first we need to add a couple more threaded inserts into part 2 as well. One into the side where it will join with panel 4 and one into the upper GPU mount. All four corners can then be secured to the internal panel using two screws each in addition to the single screw into the side between panel 2 and 4. The bottom parts of the case are joined together using a long joining piece like this. And in your SDL there will be three different tolerances for you to try out to see which one will comfortably fit the tightest. If necessary you can gently tap the joining piece into place with something light until it's flush with the rest of the body. The internal chassis is now pretty much done and we're ready to start installing some parts. The order here doesn't really matter too much, but I prefer to install the flex power supply first, using these two brackets. Here we need to add two threaded inserts into the L-shaped bracket as well as one insert into the flat bracket. The flat bracket can then be secured to the underside of the power supply before lifting the whole thing in place onto the main chassis, then securing it in place with a M3 screw from the outside of the chassis. Next, we can wrap the L-shaped bracket around the power supply and also secure that in place using another M3 screw from the outside of the chassis, as well as one more screw from the backside of the internal panel. The bottom power supply bracket requires two more screws to secure it into the bottom of the internal panel, and in the final design there will be another hole right here to fit the screwdriver through to actually access the screw. You're probably wondering why is there a big opening at the bottom of the case? Well, actually, this is to plug in our power cable, which has to be a 90 degree cable, by the way. The cable simply feeds down here and plugs into the power supply from the bottom. 
before being channeled out to the rear of the case. The hole in the bottom can then be covered up with this snap-in bracket that just pops into place and can be removed by inserting your finger into the hole and pulling it towards you. Before we can add our motherboard, we want to pre-bend and drop into place our 300mm long PCIe riser cable. The riser cable simply clamps between the motherboard and the internal panel. Our motherboard can then be secured in place using 4 M3 screws. Since we'll be using a couple top-mounted 92mm fans, it's a good idea to carefully bend the PCIe riser cable so it stays clear of the fan blades. The fan secures in place like you'd expect with regular fan screws. And we might as well just add the GPU power cables at this point because it's easier to do now, before securing in place the second fan the same way. If you're still watching at this point, I'm going to assume you like what you see. Why not leave a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel so you don't miss out on all the other projects coming up in my next videos. At this point in the build, we can add all our necessary power cables and clean them up nicely with some zip ties. We can also add our 12mm power button. And due to the thickness of the rear panel, we want to make sure that our 12mm power button has long enough threads to fit all the way through. So make sure you check out the links in the video description to find the correct parts required to build this case. Next up is the GPU. And remember here that the GPU cannot be thicker than two slots and no longer than 270mm. Especially when using a longer GPU, we want to hold it at a slight angle when connecting the PCIe riser cable before carefully bending it into its final position. The GPU can then be secured in place using one screw up here as well as one more screw below the GPU right here. This one might be a little tricky to install, so if you have a flexible screwdriver like this, that will help a lot. If not, you can access it from the side as well. To join the upper part of the chassis together, we have this external top panel, which has a built-in joint that simply slides between the panel and will lock them together. There's also a little divot on one side of the chassis to lock the panels into place. So we want to make sure the divot and the pin on the panel are on the same side before sliding the panel into place. We can then grab the other half of the panel and slide that in the same way, locking it into the little divot. The two-piece front panel uses the exact same joint as the top, with the logo panel with the joint at the bottom and the plain panel at the top. Keep in mind that if you have a printer that fits a 250 by 250 mm print volume, you can print the top panel as one single piece. And if you have a printer that fits a 200 by 200 mm print volume, you can print the front panel as one single piece without the split, if you prefer an overall cleaner looking exterior. And the only thing left to do at this point is to add the two external side panels. And the pattern here is quite unique, where we have the large hex mesh filled with a small hex mesh. In the 3D file itself, the part will look like this, where the big hex pattern is visible and it's built up of a bunch of 45 degree angles making up the pattern, forcing the slicer to print all the angled geometry as walls. And then it's up to you to add the inner mesh by changing some settings in your slicer. To ensure part strength, we want to make sure our wall loops, or sometimes called perimeters, are set to at least 4, maybe even 5, while our top layers must be 0, and the same for our bottom layers, also 0. That's going to leave us with a sliced file that looks like this, where we can clearly see the big hex pattern created in addition to the perforation in the panel to allow air to pass through. My recommendation is that the infill density is set to about 20% and that the infill type is set to honeycomb. And from my experience, I've found that honeycomb infill is the strongest option when it comes to infill-only panels, without compromising too much of the part strength. At the bottom of the side panel, there's a 45 degree edge that hooks onto the lower part of the chassis. Before installing the side panels, we want to make sure that no cables are sticking out past the edge of the chassis, to ensure that nothing is pushing against the side panel to make it bulge out. We also need to install a few magnets to ensure that the side panel will stay in place on the chassis. To do that, we can simply lay the chassis on its side before installing the correct side panel, then flip the side panel over so the magnet sides of both parts are facing each other. This way we know which magnet holes need to stick to each other. We want to start by pushing magnets into the four holes in the main chassis which may or may not, depending on your printer's tolerances, need a tiny amount of glue. We can then stick a stack of magnets onto the already installed magnets, 
before flipping it 180 degrees into the opposing hole. This ensures correct polarity every time. When all four magnets are installed, the panel should just snap into place like this. We can then repeat the same process for the opposite side panel before dropping that into place as well. And just like that, our case is now complete. And I'm really happy with how this case turned out. This is my first time trying out an actual color in any of my builds, and I absolutely love the green and black combo. And again, just to demonstrate how the power cable is installed, it's as simple as removing the magnetic side panel, pulling out the little cover plate, attaching the cable through the hole in the bottom panel, snapping the cover back in place, and placing the cable in the little groove before dropping into place the side panel, taking between 10 to 15 seconds in total, without needing any tools. My favorite part about this case is how portable it is, how you can simply pick it up and drop it into pretty much any average sized backpack and take it with you to enjoy some gaming wherever you are. And when you're done, you just throw it back in the backpack and be on your way. Comparing the size to my last project, which was an ATX case, you can really see how compact this case is. Speaking of compact, this side panel doesn't look very compact, does it? How is that going to fit on a 180mm print bed, you may ask? Well, the answer is, it's not, because this little stack of parts will turn into a tiny printer-friendly side panel. All we need to do is lay these flat and slide them onto our X-joint one at a time. The sides of all the panels have little grooves in them that fit together, so make sure all the panels sit flush with each other when you push them in. Then we've got these 45 degree funny looking butterfly joints that push into the holes at an angle. These come in 0.1 and 0.2 tolerances in the STL, so use the tightest one you can comfortably insert with your fingers. The benefit of using a butterfly joint at 45 degrees when joining panels is that it gets strength in not only the butterfly direction but also in the up and down movement of the panels, which means it pretty much cannot undo itself as opposed to a regular 90 degree straight down butterfly, which can come loose very easily if not melted or glued into place. When all four butterflies are installed, we now have a functional, quite sturdy side panel without using a single screw or any glue. All that's left to do now is add magnets the same way as shown earlier in the video. And the side panel should just snap into place just like that. One thing you might notice is that the split version of the side panel is a little bit thicker than the 300mm version. And unfortunately, it has to be this way to allow enough room for the joining pieces, which are not required in the 300mm version, and therefore it can also be slimmer. From an aesthetic point of view, you can of course see the split lines, but it blends nicely into the design without being too noticeable in my opinion. Now, let's move over to some performance testing. Keep in mind that due to the compactness of this case, it's not intended for super powerful CPUs and GPUs due to the limited CPU cooler clearance of only 40mm. In this system specifically, I'm using an Intel Core i5-10400 CPU with a TDP rating of 65 watts, cooled by a Noctua L9i low-profile CPU cooler. For the GPU, I'm using a Asus 2070 Super Blower Style card. When running a Cinebench stress test on the i5-10400, we're looking at a CPU temperature reaching an initial peak of 77 degrees before stabilizing at around 70 degrees for the duration of the test. Moving over to the GPU, when running a Fermark stress test on the 2070 Super Blower card, we're looking at a maximum temperature of about 85 degrees. Keep in mind, as I mentioned before, this is not a regular GPU with regular fans. It's a blower style card, which is running hot no matter what system I put it into. During Warzone gaming, this GPU would max out at 83 degrees. And I gotta be honest, these results did not look very promising. So I decided to try another card as well with a regular fan. Throwing in a 1660 Super single fan ITX card, running the same Fermark stress test, we're now looking at a maximum temperature of just over 70 degrees. Based on these two results, we can assume that most normal GPUs will probably be in the temperature range of 70 to 80 degrees at most under full load. And I know a lot of you guys are worried about the PC melting and turning into a liquid puddle of plastic. Well, don't worry, that's not gonna happen. Just print the case in PETG or any other material that can handle some heat and you have nothing to worry about. Overall, even though this project may seem very simple to assemble, it's been a real challenge designing it, especially when adding tiny printer friendly into the equation, as well as printability and function. 
My goal was to create a LAN party friendly, backpack friendly gaming PC and I'm super happy with how this turned out. If you are interested in checking out the files and building this project for yourself, you can get the files by checking out the printables link in the video description where you can access the files by either becoming a club member or for a one-time fee. And as mentioned earlier, you can find full Britain step-by-step -step instructions on printables guiding you through the entire building process. If you become a club member, you will automatically be sent a welcome email. In that email, there's a Discord server invite link that you can use to join the server if you want to, where you can get project help or interact with other members. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed watching this project as much as I enjoyed building it. Don't hesitate to ask any questions you may have or throw in your future project suggestions down in the comments below. I'd very much appreciate a thumbs up if you liked this video. And please consider subscribing to the channel so you don't miss out on my upcoming builds. Thank you so much for watching and I really hope you want to come around another time to watch some of my future projects.